the San Antonio Independent School District, uh, which is our oldest and largest urban district here in the city of San Antonio. And we're going to have um, Sylvester Pettis come up. Right. You want to say a couple words? Dr. Rosales, all right. It's not happenstance that Alamo Heights is still number one and Edgewood is still dead last. So when you look at some of the issues that we have, we have the same common language. The state gives us common language. But I appreciate that data because that is going to be a big, hot legislative agenda item for this year. Uh, you know, what was it? Rodriguez versus uh, SAISD? Uh, I think that was way back in 1972. We had Edgewood versus Kirby in 1989, and here we are in 2012, and we're still looking at some of the same unequal funding situations. I think we have to really highlight the fact that we've got 93% low eco this in SAISD, and until little Maria has a desk and, and books at home, just like they do in, in Alamo Heights, then we're really not gonna move the needle. That's, that's my little. PSA for SAIS. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for sharing I don't that. We can get as passionate about state funding as we are about SA 2020. Got to change, guys. Got to change. Well, good morning. Um, I'm from San Antonio ISD. And um, as Patrick said, we're the oldest school district and in, in the center of the city. And we want to be the number one urban school district. And so we do have mock work to do um, in these next few years. Um, we have about 54,000 students are um, economically disadvantaged student population is 93%. So you know they come to school with some challenges. Um, and free and reduced lunch is like 59%. Our graduation rates, we changed your template a little bit um, in 2012, our projection is 85%. So you can see that we've always, we've been lagging behind the state in graduation rates, but we did implement uh, lever teams at all of our secondary campuses, actually in 2010, I believe. And so we made some significant gains in 2011, and we hope we're gonna see some really good gains again for 2012 like everybody else we're waiting for the final AEIS report to come out so we don't have anything to compare it to yet. Our advanced course completion for 2011 it was 35 percent and most of the, much of that was from dual credit. Um, again we have a lot of students taking advanced placement courses but not scoring at a three four or five. The AP percent passing rate is 13 uh, percent. We're waiting on 2012. We had laying the foundation for about three years, so we're hoping that we will see some gains from that uh, based on last year's scores, and we should be finding out soon. Dual credit, we have, as Harlandale, we have more students enrolled in dual credit courses because they know immediately what their grade is, and many of those courses dual credit courses are through career and technology because a lot of teachers earn their master's degree in educational administration rather than their content area. Um, participation rate for SAT and ACT, we have a lot of kids participating, <laughs> but we're one of those at the low end of the students who meet the criteria which is, is very unfortunate because that means they're starting college in remedial classes and using their scholarship funds. We definitely want to change that trend. Our college ready scores, you can see they've been consistent, consistently low. And we have done prep classes, we have done pullouts, we have done Saturdays, Every way you can do college prep or test prep, we have done it over the last several years and we consistently see those same numbers. PSAT participation rate, we test um, all of our 10th graders and all of our 11th graders. 
when the class of 2012 entered ninth grade, we tested every ninth grader, every 10th grader, every 11th grader, and um, you, their SAT scores were still around 5%. So, and we test every eighth grader on Explore for the past five years, I would say. And we test every 10th grader takes plan for about 10 years. So they have been exposed to many types of um, college ready exams. Apply Texas, we had 90% of the students complete Apply, Apply Texas this past year. FAFSA, we were in a pilot with um, Department of Ed in 2010, our baseline um, submission was 42%. We had a big meeting, worked with economics teachers, counselors, um, all of our San Antonio Education Partnership Advisors. We really thought we were gonna really move that, uh, that submission rate and it went to 48%. So we were very disappointed. The next year we hired part-time retired counselors and we moved it to 78. But that's all they focused on. Um, and it was really tracking them down and saying, no, you've only put your name on it. That's all you've done. Come back over here and sit down and let's do it right now. Um, it is about persistence. But we know research says that's the number one indicator of whether kids go to college or not. So hopefully if we can really make a difference with that, students will see hope and we'll maybe take the test more seriously. I, I know sometimes kids take, go in and take the SAT or ACT and say, you know, yeah, I really wasn't prepared. I didn't know what to do. We're like, we've been telling you like a hundred times, but they don't quite listen all the time till they get there and then they think, oh wow, I should take this seriously. And they don't realize the consequence of not taking it seriously is placed into developmental courses until sometimes it's too late. Our district, district goals, these are some things we've been doing already. I don't know why that keeps messing up. 95% of the ninth graders, you know, it's important that they earn all their credits they need to move on to 10th grade, because otherwise they're, they'll be walking out the door, they'll be really frustrated. Um, that is doable, it requires time, it doesn't require money. 100% of the 11th graders write and revise three different college essays using sample essay prompts. Again, doesn't cost money. It requires time within English three class. We've purchased books for them um, from Princeton Review, sample essay prompts, and that should just be part of the curriculum, which it is this year. 100% of the graduates visit two or more colleges or universities. We've been fortunate to have a gear up grant. This is our second one. so every eighth, current eighth grader, they've already visited at least one college and our class of 2012, I'd say the majority of those kids visited five or more and that makes a big difference. They have to go see it and be physically there to kind of picture themselves as getting into that, I can do this, I can be a college student. Now that does cost money, but not a lot. 30% um, of the students are in college credit while in high school. We're working toward that goal. It's really not that much money as long as you know you have your own staff that can teach the dual credit courses. It's really a matter of purchasing textbooks, which the college professors tend to change every semester or year. <laughs> can be costly. 95% um, of the seniors complete Apply Texas. Doesn't cost any money, it's just time and persistence and 95% of the seniors submit their FAFSA. Again, it's time, it's not money. That's it, thank you. I'd like to call up next is the uh, right here, Southwest Independent School District, uh, Superintendent Lloyd Verstuff. Good morning, everyone. And uh, I don't know how to get up my slides. I'll ask Liz. And I just want to uh, thank for the other two schools presenting that was very good information, and, and thank Jorge. 
And uh, I'm going to go through a few slides, and then I'm going to turn it over to Liz here because I think you deserve to have the same depth and breadth uh, that our experts like Liz and Roxanne, Samantha, and Dr. Healy can bring because they live in this world uh, every day, and, and I can touch the surface of this world. But, you know, we, uh, we are a, uh, a recovering non-college environment school district. <laughs> so we have really uh, looked at our information, and we followed our class, graduating class of 2007. We started this work a while back, and as we look at our, our class, we know that half of our graduating class went to college. Four years later, less than 15% graduated from college. And so that's real important. We know that what we have to do is, is change the environment change <coughs> and change the culture of what we're doing. I can't breathe this morning. So anyway, we've done a lot of things in our district, and I think we're going to see that reflected in the slides here. And uh, this meeting... I'm glad to be part of a city that really wants to push this uh, initiative, really wants to push this issue of a college-going climate, because that's what we all want for our kids, and that's what we all want for our future. And so our picture of, of Southwest ISD is that we have 12,000 students, 66% of those are at risk, 83% are equal dis, 12% um, left, 90% uh, of our students are of Hispanic uh, ethnicity, 3% African-American, 5% uh, Anglo, and we have about a 95% attendance rate. And so uh, our average spending per pupil you see is 92%, and how that compares to the state of Texas. As we looked at our graduation rate over time, like other districts in 2007 through 2009, we saw a dip in our graduation rate that had to do with the change of definition uh, of graduates. And so. Uh, with that change and with different types of initiatives put in place, that graduation rate has now crept back up in above the 80% mark. Uh, students taking advanced courses in our district, which has really been an initiative for us uh, pushing over the course of the year, knowing that advanced courses uh, are those type of things that really uh, uh, bridge students to post high school opportunities. And so as you look at advanced uh, courses that we've improved those to 30% in 2010, if we have the data from 11 and 12, uh, at the time that we noticed that we were a recovering uh, non-college environment school district. And because we tracked our, our class uh, graduates in 2007 and we knew that less than uh, 15 of our kids graduated four years later, we knew we had to do work differently. And so uh, we went back, we started doing work differently, and we, we think we're going to see a lot of that result in 2011, 2012 uh, as we move forward. When we look at our AP percent passing rate, uh, our advanced placement uh, courses there, and uh, we see that there's something in 2009 uh, that we really want to go back and research. We haven't researched that yet as we pulled the data, uh, but we can see that we run a, a constant somewhere between 10 and 20 percent of our students uh, uh, taking AP or passing AP. This is an issue in our dual credit uh, receiving college credit. Uh, that uh, we basically have to pull by hand, and it was one of those uh, conversations I had with Liz about it, well, how do we draw this data. And we've seen on the last two districts who presented that you have this data. And this may be one of those areas that we need to learn from, and that's why we're here today. And so uh, that's one of the issues I want Liz to speak to as soon as I'm done. When we look at the SAT, ACT participation rate, uh, us versus the state of Texas at Southwest ISD, uh, we see that uh, it's between 40 50 percent and, and pretty constant, and the state level as we compare it to them is between 60 and 70. Uh, our current participation rate, uh, as we look at it, the average scores for SAT uh, Southwest is 1,324 compared to the state 1,462. Uh, and then we have our reading, math, and our writing uh, SAT scores. Um, this slide here uh, are those uh, indicators of college ready, which goes right along with Jorge's presentation that we saw earlier, uh, that in 2010, 6% uh, of our students were at the college ready, which means of the 51% of the students who left in 2007, uh, there were uh, about 45% of those students had to take developmental courses prior to going into to college. And so that's not where we want our level of college ready, and that's why I mean uh, when I say that we're a recovering district. This is a kind of a point of pride slide for Southwest. Knowing what we knew uh, back in the, the day as we got involved in this process, and this meeting didn't happen last week. This meeting basically has been in preparation for a year and a half. And so uh, 
I had the pleasure of basically bumping into Gene Russell some year and a half ago and got involved in this whole process of what do we do to push the needle in college attainment for our students in, in San Antonio and the surrounding areas. And so that basically encompassed a number of different series of meetings, a number of uh, out-of-state opportunities to listen to other organizations coming back and putting together this foundational group of school districts uh, that include Harlandale, San Antonio, Northside, and Southwest as the leadership school districts uh, for diplomas. And so we have the leadership districts, but the work that these four districts do basically uh, will trickle down to all the other surrounding districts in San Antonio, moving the needle by every one of us moving our small grid of school districts, our small grid creating a college-going culture in every one of our districts, and then focusing on those elements of college-ready, college-preparedness. And uh, this is one of our issues. When we look last year, that almost 100% of our students, uh, 9 through 11, are participating in the PSAT. <coughs> this is the slide of uh, our initiative to make sure that every one of our students uh, does an application to apply Texas last year uh, that resulted in almost 80% of our graduating students. Uh, percentage of 12th graders in the numbers of FAFSA filers uh, is 37%, uh, which is uh, the information that we're drawing from the FAFSA online. It doesn't match the information that we have. We know that we had 64% of our graduating seniors uh, completing a FAFSA and have it signed online. And so. Uh, that's another one of those issues uh, that we really want to talk about and have some conversation about. So uh, these are our goals as uh, we look at Southwest ISD, that we want 80% of our students uh, to be uh, on time towards graduation. Uh, after the ninth grade, 80% of our 11th graders uh, to meet or exceed uh, the SAT composite, 70% of our 11th graders scoring at the above uh, 20 on the ACT. 95% of our graduates from high school uh, within five years. And so uh, graduating from high school on time is another one of those indicators of post high school success. And so monitoring our students from the ninth, uh, 10th, 11th, actually we monitor them from the first grade now. And so we put, uh, from this work, we also created our district vision where we're actually monitoring students from the first grade cohorts of students as they move through the system so that we can uh, make sure that all of our students have the opportunity to be college ready, college prepared, and then whether or not they go into that field is up to them. Uh, but even the workforce uh, 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 demands that they have the same type of level of readiness, preparedness. And so uh, we also uh, have said in one of our vision things, we haven't had a National Merit Scholar in our district in 10 years. And so that was really not a point of pride for Southwest. And we know what National Merit Scholar means. And it's not the fact that you become a National Merit Scholar. It's what's going on and it's the type of environment uh, that's basically readily available for the students to become and to achieve such an academic prowess. And so we haven't had one in 10 years. Last night at our board meeting, we recognized two National Merit Scholars uh, for the first time in 10 years. And so just bringing up the dialogue and, and, and bringing up the information uh, has been tremendous to, to, it's all about a movement and it's all about a climate. And I think that's what we're trying to create in San Antonio. 80% uh, of our seniors will complete the, the FAFSA, or the FAFSA. 100% of seniors will complete the Applied Texas, 100% uh, My Map uh, Ola by May 2013, 80% of our graduates uh, will enroll full or part-time in college and or in some form of credentialing uh, opportunity post high school. And we, we have really changed the way in our district because of the work that we've been able to do uh, with Diplomas now, now that it has a name. Prior to a couple of months ago, it didn't even have a name. Uh, but we've been meeting to, to plan this meeting uh, for quite some time. And the charge, the charge that really lies within these four districts uh, to do things that we've never done before to change the skyline of San Antonio like no one ever thought could happen before. By using uh, the, the partnerships between higher education, public education, nonprofit world, the business world, different set of eyes that Jorge started this meeting off with is tremendous. It's tremendous what we can do by every one of us changing the skyline in our district, contributing to the overall picture of what San Antonio can become. Uh, because it's tremendous the, the level of aspiration we set for the next generation of students, and it's tremendous about what we can do. And we have been involved in this effort 
the little changes that we've made in our district, we have seen uh, a great result. Uh, we have seen great direction. We have seen a different level of energy from our kids, I'm sure, like, like you all do. And we know there's a lot we can learn from the people in this room. We want to keep learning and, and, and keep going that direction. I think we have an, another slide. I'm going to ask Liz to speak to this one. This is our framework uh, of achieving the goals. And, and Liz just joined us from Trinity U. And, and if you don't know Liz, uh, she's high energy. She's a lot of fun. Uh, and she's extremely intelligent and, and extremely dedicated and, and wants to make a huge difference. We're very proud to, to have her uh, in our district, and we're very proud. And, and if you're sitting in this room, you need to be very proud about being part of a movement that's going to change San Antonio. It's going to change the level of educational attainment in San Antonio. In our district, we used to have a goal to get our kids to commencement night, to graduate them, let them walk across the stage at the Alamo Dome. That's no longer our goal. Our goal is that every kid that we serve, that we have them to a level of readiness, preparedness, that they graduate from college or some form of credentialing. We know that the difference between a high school graduate and a college graduate is about $10,000 a year. The difference between a college graduate and a non-high school graduate is a million dollars over the course of their lifetime. It's huge. And we will not allow our kids to live that quality of life while we have them in our system. And that's going to be our attitude. It has been our attitude. And so let me let Liz speak to our framework, uh, and then I'm going to sit down and, and let the expert come up. I'm actually not going <laughs> to. Thanks, Dr. B. I'm not going to speak too long to this because I think this is something we can share. And this is a draft form. This is what I began my work with. And so I used Gene's. Uh, format across the top for this, but then we're actually working with David Conley's four uh, keys and trying to, to use that as a framework. And, and I'm a visual learner. I have, to, I have to chart what's happening and so on. So we'll share this chart later. Thank you all. I, I was the one who said that we should use a, a protocol where the slides were automatically timed so superintendents didn't talk too long. And so <laughs> I'm going to yield our time now to Northside. Nobody throws the MC. Uh, we are now going to have the Northside Independent School District come up and uh, present their data that they have. And Northside, I think, is our largest district and, and also has some really wonderful success stories that they're going to share with us. Um, yeah, we have, we have Debbie Healy and Ron Stevens. Ron Stevens. Thank you all very much. I'm Debbie Healy. I'm the Director of Guidance and Counseling for Northside ISD. And I'm going to give you kind of the holistic view of some of the foundational supports that our school counselors implement in helping students all the way from pre-K to grade 12 in building that framework for college readiness. And also for social emotional health, for academic fitness, for citizenry in terms of their character development. And again, it's a very holistic framework. So first of all, we work toward the support of, of children um, who have the cognitive, emotional, psychological wherewithal. So we're addressing all aspects of their readiness for college. And as Conley talks about some of those soft skills, 
because we know that if students don't have those skills, they may make it to college but not have the healthy habits and the persistence that allows them to remain in college, to have solid, well-developed career goals, and to persist toward graduation. So our framework tries to address each of these things, and it is the framework that comes from the Texas Education Agency in terms of guidance and counseling programs that are implemented in four component areas which include um, responsive services that help us to address student needs, their individualized student planning, which puts them on the trajectory toward academic fitness and, and college readiness, uh, guidance curriculum that helps them to develop their character literacy and their skills for healthy citizenry, and of course, um, the system support, which allows all of us to support children and to support the educators who uplift kids through professional development. So how do we best do this? We have seven skills that come to us from the Texas Education Agency that we as counselors continuously um, create lessons and specifically teach in the same way that we would teach math facts or sentence structure. We teach self-confidence development, the motivation to achieve in pro-social fashion, which would be achievement in school, decision-making models, goal-setting, planning, problem-solving skills in youth their interpersonal effectiveness, their communication skills, their cross-cultural <coughs> appreciation and effectiveness, and the responsible behavior. And all of these things are infused into the college readiness. So yes, as they write a, a dream board, a resume, maybe when they're in first grade, they begin the visioning process of who they will become and how they will um, achieve their goals and dreams. So all of this, uh, again, starts very early and is repeated in a kind of spiral fashion that is developmentally <coughs> articulated. So for little kids, it, it looks the way it should look. Maybe they're puppets and artistic activities. And for older children, it is um, things like resume writing and college exploration and writing the communication skills of writing their college letters and mock interviews and so forth. So we promote the soft skills. We use the uh, Search Institute, which is the most highly researched model, I think, in America with a sample size of more than 2.2 million children. We use it as a framework because what it has taught us is as we build these assets in youth, this is what it looked like, that children are more able when they have greater assets in their lives to exhibit leadership, maintain good health, value diversity, and succeed in school. So we work as a school district with counselors and with all staff to build these kinds of assets in youth. And there are 40 assets after meta-analyses that show what youngsters need to succeed. So yes, we <coughs> inspire them to have these dreams, but how do we help them to have the supports that allow them to persist and allow them to have build capacity so that they can achieve these dreams? And this is a framework we use pre-K through 12. The other piece of it is reducing risk among our young people. Again, look at those stats on the zero to 10 side. When young people have fewer assets, and I'm not gonna read you the list of assets, but if you go to the Search Institute website there, it will articulate for you what those 40 assets are. They don't cost money. They're things about building capacity in our youth and really mobilizing the strength of our community to support our kids. So the youngsters with fewer assets, zero to 10, as you can see, have a higher propensity for violence, problem alcohol use, illicit drug use, and early sexual activity. Youth with 30 to 40 assets, look how drastically reduced those risk factors are. So again, we're always looking at trying to reduce risk and <coughs> amplify strengths so that they can maximize their educational opportunities. And that's a huge piece of college readiness. So we use programs like the Leader in Me, and we're using that with very young children so that they view themselves as leaders, which begins that college-going culture so early in terms of identity. The 15 Days of Caring campaigns, the seven habits, so that youngsters are developing those habits early, early on. Advisory and class meetings, Rachel's Challenge, positive parenting involvement. And so we're, again, starting with the young kiddos which college, with college knowledge, college vocabulary, college awareness, dream <coughs> boards, student-led conferencing, career investigation, um, to, again, put them on that trajectory and keep them there. And then, of course, the academic focus. Our counselors are in the classrooms teaching um, specific lessons, 24 different lessons, 
at grades pre-K through five. Uh, Four-year planning, academic advisement, ready step, PSAT for all 10th and 11th graders, AVID programs, college visits, UTSA ready, collaborations with the Alamo Academies. The list is very long and my colleagues will <coughs> take you through some of the numbers and some of the more specifics. So I will turn it over to them. This is Dr. Ron Stevens. Thank you, Debbie. I need to uh, set up two spreadsheets. So I'm going to turn off the microphone and be right back. Oh, thank you, Marshall. Thank you. I could do a little song <laughs> at this point, a little karaoke if I had something on the screen. I will tell you while Ron is getting ready, I'm Dennis Ann Strong. I'm the Executive Director for Secondary Instruction and I see a lot of familiar faces. One familiar face that I see in the room is Greg Darneder, who I had the pleasure of, of collaborating with at the pilot uh, group for the FAFSA project. Greg, I will tell you that the reason I am late today, you can take this back to Secretary Duncan, that the reason I am late today is I had to meet with the team for one of our high schools that has gone into stage one in the AYP measures <laughs> and oh if there is ever a time we have four years to work on NCLB and look at an improvement model rather than a dead in the water model. So that's my song. <laughs> now I'll do my dance. <laughs> Yes, when in Rome. Now, it's been an interesting process to go through that. Northside uh, last year had one middle school in stage one. I'm filling time, by the way. <laughs> uh, had one middle school in stage one, so we sort of got a trial run, and luckily that middle school met at AYP this year, so they're in year two of stage one and hopefully won't go to stage two. When I get to, oh, Ron's almost ready. When I get to my part of the presentation, I don't have the benefit of seeing the presentations that precede ours, but I will make several references to the unknowns regarding our state accountability system and hoping that we continue to be able to have some of those measures and perhaps even expand on some of those measures that might help us better evaluate student progress and meeting or at least ex perhaps exceeding or meeting student goals. All right, Ron. Good morning. Um, Jorge, thank you for uh, showing us your data. I appreciate that with the SAT and, and all, those kinds of, uh, all those kinds of data. Um, I'm the PEAMS coordinator at Northside, and so um, w one of the things I get to do is learn from these folks uh, and um, to see how they use the, the information that's available to us. One of the things that I did this year uh, for our uh, superintendent's cabinet was take another look at um, uh, advanced courses. As you, as you know, the school districts know that you get a, a fairly meaningless percent of students who are taking advanced courses in high school. We had a 28, 29, 30 uh, percent taking uh, advanced courses. That really doesn't mean a whole lot because we couldn't figure out what that, that meant. So this year I decided to dig a little deeper into that information and give us a baseline because uh, we, what we wanted to do obviously was to get more kids college ready, take advanced courses, those kinds of things. So I broke down the uh, summer PEAMS data into these categories. So, for example, our high schools are across the top, and here are the number of students, and it's a duplicated count, by the way, because you can, a student can take three or four courses. Here are the number of students across our high schools that have taken and completed English language arts, math, <coughs> computer science, science and social studies. These 
this is a mixture of AP courses, dual credit courses, and then just regular advanced courses. For example, uh, one of the things that is a, a, goal, a goal of our uh, superintendent and board this year is to increase the aware, uh, participation in fine arts and athletics, but also dual credit. Uh, you'll see in here uh, it, a lot of the advanced courses are music for, art for, and incorporates the fine arts. You know, here's the fine arts one. So we're not entirely focused on AP type of courses or dual credit courses, because you'll see then in, in the AEIS indicators, there are advanced courses in fine arts. So we can't lose sight of the difference between a AP course, an AP, AP dual credit course, a dual credit course, and an advanced course. And as you see, uh, we have all different kind of flavors. Some courses have one student in them, some two, some hundreds of students. So um, that, that information is available to you, and it's available to you in your PEAMS uh, course completion information. This is going to serve as a baseline for us to compare the next five years. We generally compare for five years. And so that's going to be a baseline for you, uh, for us. So any questions on, on this information? It's AP, dual credit, advanced courses. Okay, let me switch to the next one. I'm trying to dance. This is a um, three-part spreadsheet that I prepared for this meeting uh, for Dennis Ann. And we had three observations here. One is that we wanted to extend a little bit on the um, data that we were being asked to provide, the number of kids taking dual credit courses you know, uh, in group, and give you a little bit more detail. So this is a five-year analysis of our dual credit courses and when they were offered. Pardon me just a little bit. There we go, see a little bit better. So you'll see that in our dual credit courses that we've offered over the five years, we have a big variety of courses. Some are AP, some are not. And if we s just scroll on down, we'll see that we've, s um, and these by TEA course number, uh, that's what the big eight digit number in the middle is. That's used to differentiate um, the different courses. You'll see the N courses are innovative courses. The courses that start with a one are career technology courses, and uh, we've we've done that throughout the years. So that's one one level of analysis that we wanted to pr present is that here are the courses that we have done for the last five years, but that's a different question than who is actually enrolled in those courses. Not all courses are created equal on dual credit because we have fewer courses that we actually had students enrolled in than we had offered. Uh, no surprise to anyone because it, it varies every year. So what I did then was to take a look at our dual credit courses. You'll see AP designated um, out to the side of if it's an AP course. Um, so a lot of these are advanced courses. Your advanced languages uh, levels three and four are advanced in AEIS. And so these are actual enrollments into those courses. Obviously, this is a duplicated count. Students can be in more than one, one course, one or more, let's say it that way. And so this is the last five years of data for us. So we're hoping to use this as another, another way of looking at information. Well, 
what I did is take a little bit different look at it because this is very interesting. You'll see that our dual course enrollment for year 9, 10, and 10, 11 was actually higher than year 12, 13. That's probably due to external forces. TEAs changed some of the curriculum requirements, and so the opportunities to take dual credit courses and advanced courses um, have actually been limited through the 4 by 4 curriculum. Uh, so just wanted to put that in. Actually, it was higher ed for the CAP. Everybody in the room knows you now have a firm CAP that you cannot take more than two dual credits. You can take five AP courses during any course year, but you can't get more than two dual credit courses. And you, with the exception of world geography and which they don't offer dual, but the world history, you can't take dual credit as a 10th grader anymore. And they're very rigid on that now. It used to be by exception. So you see that we actually have fewer kids taking fewer, and I will say it this way, we have actually fewer enrollments in dual credit courses than we had in prior years. Uh, Dennis Alexander is our uh, director of career and technology. He was telling me that's not unexpected because we were, uh, we had a bunch of career and technology dual credit courses that we had worked out with uh, Northwest Vista and SAC, and we have a, had big enrollments of that. But I believe, Dennis, they stopped paying for the, our kids have to pay for those courses now, which actually has decreased the enrollment into dual credit courses. So our, our um, dual credit enrollment and course taking opportunities have actually decreased in the uh, perhaps the last couple years because of external forces, not because we don't have the courses and w we don't offer them and those kinds of things. The courses are there and here's the type of analysis that, uh, that we're trying to take a look at. That's a very good question and a great idea. <laughs> Write that down. <laughs> so the answer is no. This is a really different way of Liz, that's the data, super. So yeah. That might be an interesting way to start. Yes, it would. Since we can get those actual oh, names right. with students, right. then we can look at are they also growing in things like, you know, as, as Dr. Healy mentioned, we cover the 10th grade PSAT and 11th grade. We ought to see some prep going on yeah. with that in the SAT, ACT. Ron is going to quickly go, I know I saw the five minute sign three minutes ago, uh, so yeah, just quickly, and I'm going to let you work the mouse, uh, so go ahead and start, yeah, okay. Uh, I put in there 99,500 on the actual enrollment system that we use, the curriculum management system. The actual number is 100,036 students, but that number, as you know, with mobility goes up and down. We are 67, almost 68% Hispanic. We have a small, compared to that uh, African American population, still a little bit larger white, uh, white population. Our attendance overall just this past year was 95.6% and this is actually AEIS data on the average per pupil spending. So two years ago it was $7,188. That, that has probably changed some. It's less yeah, it's less, you know, because of the cuts that we have had in education funding and it's hovering just around the upper 6,000 number. We have a 53% uh, and I think actually right now that's a 54. Okay, go ahead. Um, our graduation rates have climbed over the past five to six years and that is highly attributed to the fact that the state has released high school allotment funding and the high schools have put 
a big chunk of that money into credit retrieval centers. Um, for the five years prior to this job, I was at a high school that when I went into that high school, the graduation rate was 79%. Last year when I left that high school, it had gone up to 92%. And it was our work in the credit retrieval centers getting those o uh, overaged, undercredited students. Next slide. Uh, students, as Ron alluded to, this is an actual percentage, uh, and this is based, the reason 2011 is left off, this is based on the AEIS report. We didn't get an 11 update, so we'll see what 12 shows us. So as far as percentage, almost 30% of whatever group of kids TEA measures through the AEIS are in advanced courses. Next slide. Uh, students taking the percentage, uh, the number, excuse me, the number of students taking the ACT, SAT, and AP, and at this point in time, you will see that we're flatlining on the AP, the number of students. Um, that, you know, there's a, a lot of, if College Board were here, and they may be, uh, then uh, you would know the push that all of us have been through for ex access to AP courses. You can see that steady climb, but for the last uh, climb, for the last two years, it's kind of leveled out. Uh, ACT, we need to see some growth there for a lot of our students. Uh, they will do better on the ACT, so we're beginning that push to grow that group of students. Go ahead, sir. Uh, AP percent passing and a, a kind of a normal statistic the College Board assures me. We saw in 2008 and 9 steady growth. We, we still saw that steady growth in numbers and we actually saw some growth in performance. And then in 10 and 11, we lost some ground. But if you remember that graph, there was a very steep climb in what I thought was very steep in the number of students. We added new teachers teaching AP courses. We know they need a minimum of three years and maybe five to really develop some master AP qualities. Go ahead, sir. Uh, I left the dual credit blank. Go ahead, because I knew Ron would bring that in. Uh, college ready scores. We've seen ever so slight, if you look at the, the key along the bottom, there's, there's not huge gains, but there are some gains, even small numbers of students and minimal gains. Liz, I noticed on yours, you compared that to the state. I didn't amend it after I saw your presentation last night, but it's right about what the state average is. Go ahead, sir. PSAT, I just threw straight straight lines across because for the last five years we have we have paid as a district using high school allotment funds to cover the cost of every 10th and 11th grader. Go ahead, sir. Uh, apply Texas, I only had one year of data and what is that, about 81, 82 percent of the kids in the next slide. This is why I know it's quick. I only had one year of data for this meeting on the FAFSA completion. And, and I just want to put a plug in for San Antonio Educational Partnership and the great job they do to support this effort in uh, about half of our high schools in Northside. The last slide are goals and targets. Those were not developed by our committee. They were developed as some, some good guesses on my part, and we will continue to work on these together and refine them. Questions? That ends our song and dance. We're going to go ahead and make a slight adjustment to the schedule and go ahead and allow you guys to take a break. Um, where's about five minutes? Where's Gene? Five minutes? Just a five minute break, stretch your legs, and then uh, come on back to the room. <laughs>